Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being with us here today. Moving on to our next discussion, titled TN Tangra, we have with us here Rafiq Elias, Kamalika Bose, Amit Chaudhary, and Sifra Lenton, who will be moderating the session, talking about Calcutta's multi ethnicities. I shall now quickly introduce our panelists. Rafiq Elias is an award winning photographer and cinematographer. He began his photographic career in Japan in 1974 while creating ad advertising for Japan Airlines, Time Magazine, and assignments for the travel section of the New York Times. He is also the director and scriptwriter of the national award win winning film, The Legend of Fat Mama, a portion of which we will be seeing this evening, which has been screened at film festivals in New York, Toronto, Barcelona, and Oslo. Kamalika Bose, our next panelist is an urban conservationist with 10 years of experience in heritage-oriented planning and advocacy, design education, and research. She is a Fulbright scholar and was formerly assistant professor at SEPT University in Ahmedabad. Her research focuses on the revitalization of urban heritage in India, most recently working with Chinese and Jain heritage in Bengal. She is currently based at the Urban Desi Design Research Institute in Bombay and is also project manager of the State of Architecture exhibition currently on display at the NGMA. Amit Chaudhary, our next panelist, is the author of six novels, the latest of which is Odysseus Abroad. His first major work of nonfiction, Calcutta, Two Years in the City, was published in 2013. He has also written a number of books of literary criticism, such as Clearing a Space and Telling Tales, and is also the recipient of the Commonwealth Literature Prize and the Sahitya Academy Award. Amit is also, also a trained and critically acclaimed singer in the Hindustani classical tradition, and is the only Indian musician to have performed twice at the London Jazz Festival. Sifra Lenton, who will be moderating the session, is a Bombay-based writer and is presently the adjunct fellow for Mumbai history at the foreign policy think tank Gateway House. She began her career as a journalist. In 1997, she wrote a series of articles for the international news agency Reuters on communities impacted by the partition of India. Her soon to be released book commissioned by the Gateway House is titled Bombay's International Linkages Then and Now and is about framing the geostrategic importance of Mumbai from a historical perspective. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's Gateway House Avid Learning Session on Tea and Tangra, Exploring Calcutta's Multi-Ethnicities. As we all know, Bombay is in India's international face to the world, and I will be, of course, coming out with a book soon on Bombay's international linkages, but Calcutta, too, is a historic port city like Bombay. And in fact, unlike Bombay, Calcutta was the capital of British India till 1911, when the subcontinent's capital was shifted to New Delhi. Though the economic, political, and cultural narrative of both cities are not the same, there are some strong similarities between the two. One of these are the foreign migrant communities who made these two cities their home during the 18th, 19th, and 20, early 20th century. They came here for work, for trade, and have left an indelible mark on the cultural fabric of both cities. Today, we have a fabulous panel to discuss not just Calcutta's multi-ethnic communities like the Chinese, the Anglo-Indians, the Armenians, the Baghdadis, and the Ar Baghdadis, who are the Arabic-speaking Jews, and the Greek community of Calcutta. Bombay doesn't have a Greek community. But our panel will also discuss the importance of multiculturalism and a cosmopolitan milieu to a, to, to a metropolitan city like Calcutta. I will be beginning with, of course, Amit. And I just want to tell you that today's format is a little different. We have slides which Kamalika will be taking us through, which will give you an idea about the different communities of Calcutta. We have a little, Amit will be reading us a few paragraphs from his book on Calcutta. The, the relevant sections on Tangra, 
Tangra, Park Street, and Fleury's. And Rafiq will be showing a few clips from his documentary, The Legend of Fat Mama, which is relevant to our discussion today. Amit, can you briefly describe the precincts of Calcutta that you've talked about in your book, Calcutta, Two Years in the City, and how these precincts are so important to your memories of the city, your childhood memories of the city? Right. Um, well, somebody said I've written about uh, like uh, two, two square miles or something like that in the city. So uh, I haven't written about a great deal of the city. Um, um, but Calcutta was very important to me uh, when I was growing up. I, I, I was born in Calcutta. I grew up in Bombay. Um, and and uh, I, I, would, I would visit Calcutta annually, sometimes twice a year. Uh, my, my uncle lived and still lives in Bhawanipur. Mm. So that's, let, let, let me say that that's the first neighborhood that, I'm, that I mentioned as being important to me. Right. Uh, I wrote my first novel, A Strange and Sublime Address, thinking about his house in, in Bhawanipur. Um, I, I, never, I never use the word Bhawanipur anywhere. Um, and, I, and, and the address I created was a fictional address. Um, some people said to me, how wonderfully you've evoked North Calcutta uh, in, the, in the book. And I said, no, but it wasn't North Calcutta, it's South Calcutta. So, so then um, they, they looked a bit puzzled and they said, where in South Calcutta is this? Uh, and I said, it's Bhawanipur. And, and they said, Ah, Bhawanipur, the, it's the North Calcutta of the South. So, so now, uh, uh, there was a sense of estrangement about that, 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 that whole area. What they were talking about is a, such, uh, a sort of historic uh, quality, um, which is common to Bhawanipur and to North Calcutta, which has to do with um, a certain experience of the city uh, and, and of its buildings. So we are talking about residential Calcutta. We are talking about narrow lanes. We are talking about uh, houses, which themselves are uh, a curious composite of features, especially in Bhawanipur. So uh, uh, when, when we look at North Calcutta, uh, uh, um, we are looking at houses or mansions that are slightly different. Do I have time to talk about this? Uh, I, know, I, know, I, mean, I, know, I know you're very pressed for time. Uh, can you talk a little about? Uh Tangra, you brought that in your book, and about Fleury's. Right. I, I, I haven't actually talked about Tangra. Have I written about you Tangra? You have. You have. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 because, uh, yeah. yeah, you've talked about it in your memories, and you have brought in a little about the Chinese community. I'd like you to talk about that. Uh, I don't know enough about the Chinese community. I mean, uh, yes, I talked about Chinese food. Yeah, uh, and the ascendancy of Chinese food for a long time in, in, in Calcutta. And uh, uh, I've talked about that bec because, again, to talk about, not to talk about the Chinese, but to talk about the Bengali. To, to this, this weird uh, character uh, whom I used to see from the outside, having grown up in Bombay, uh, 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 and the daily excursions, let's say, into, into Chinatown, or not daily, weekly excursions, or monthly, uh, they, they have obsession with Chinese food and other ki kinds of cuisine. So it's basically to talk about um, the excitements that make up uh, or made up Bengali life at a particular point of time, which had often to do with excursions within the city where one part of the city was completely foreign to the other. And this brings us back to Bhawanipur and North Calcutta and the North Calcutta of the South, this, the constant sense of estrangement in the city. Um, I, I, I think I should talk about, I, I think to, if you're talking about Calcutta, to talk about North Calcutta and the South Calcutta is important. North Calcutta is what, what in another city would be called the old town. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the city, it's the part of the city where also you, um, where the, where the so-called Bengal Renaissance is supposed to have occurred. It's where Tagore lived, it's where various other people lived. It's also the part of the city to which landowners uh, moved um, and build their palatial houses. Um, thinking Calcutta is the city of the future. So this is the, uh, already the kind of early 19th century. Yeah. So, so those houses in, in the north uh, are very interesting for having palatial, grand, and often neoclassical features. Uh, 
Corinthian pillars, etc. Mm -hmm. And when you come to the south, you come to a part of Calcutta which has arisen actually not in the 19th century as much as the early 20th century. And already over there, you see a rejection of, in many of these houses, of these neoclassical features and a new kind of playfulness in these buildings, uh, in, which includes European features and Bengali features in a completely, and sometimes often art deco features, in a completely new kind of combination. Uh, I think this, this uh, South Calcutta and its houses are deeply interesting because they point to this, this playfulness uh, of, of 20th century Calcutta, which continued to be such a compelling city even after it ceased to be uh, the capital of India. Uh, it stopped being the capital of India in 1911 uh, because, because, uh, because the British wanted to sort of marginalize Calcutta because of its politics. However, I know from my childhood that Calcutta continued to be the most interesting metropolitan experience for an Indian uh, right to, to the 70s. Uh, the, the experience of, of a city uh, and a city sort of uh, which creates its own terms of modernity in terms of streets, buildings, spaces was to be found and to be encountered in Calcutta right unto the, until the 70s. And it's, it's South Calcutta and its buildings which happen largely after it stops being a capital that, that uh, tell us why it, it was such an interesting city uh, um, long after the kind of canonical moment of the Renaissance or even the moment of it being the political capital of the country. What was going on there? Mm -hmm. and, and to tie up with your kind of theme, what was going off on there obviously came from a very mixed provenance, right. uh, uh, European and, and Bengali and, and uh, Art Deco, that's, that's a very interesting kind You're of it's mix. It's more hybridization in terms of its built heritage. I, but I what think, about the people, I think yeah, the, the I communities? Think it, I, I think not only is it hybridized, but I think it lacks, it has no, it, 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 not, the, the, when I'm talking about the buildings of South Calcutta, it neither has um, neoclassical hubris, mm. which is, it doesn't have mainly those Corinthian pillars. Mm. It doesn't have, it's not pretending to be some kind of version of the European Renaissance. And nor is it pretending to be like the Birla temple in, the, in mm. South Calcutta now, some kind of Hindu structure. It's, it's an astonishing cosmopolitan, completely modern edifice without any kind of either nostalgia or hubris. Oh. And, and I find that extremely interesting. Uh, Kamalika, coming to you as an architect, how do you think the, what has been the imprint of foreign migrant communities, you know, who've made Calcutta their home in the 18th, 19th, 20th century, as we are talking about these communities? What is their foot, footprint or imprint on the city? So, uh, okay. you want this? Uh, so I think now I'm just taking off from Omit and he's really set what to most people is the dominant narrative for Calcutta as a city is that of North Calcutta, which was uh, the, the traditional uh, quarters, also known. So, so you have the divide between the white town and the black town, and these are terms that we actually are now avoided. But because of that, this, there arose the need and the presence of the gray town. So the gray town separated the white town from the black town, and which is why, unlike medieval cities, which had fortifications that you see even Shah Jahanabad in Delhi or uh, Ahmedabad wall city. Calcutta did not require any sort of these segregatory patterns between the uh, white part of the city and the black part of the city because the gray part was the inter intermediary. And the gray as a term is really interesting because gray is also uh, connotative of blurring boundaries. And that's where these uh, ethnic communities all kind of settled and they kind of intermeshed uh, meshed into each other. So you didn't know where the Jewish neighborhood ends and where it seamlessly tran uh, transitions into a Chinese neighborhood. And that also lends to the spirit of multiculturalism okay. and multi-ethnicity. And that, I think, is very, very different and unique for Calcutta and that you don't see in other cities where, like, the Bohra Ward will have mm. a very specific geographic and a territorial definition, which none of these ethnic neighborhoods actually do. So um, I have a short presentation that yeah, I'll just that, uh, yeah. run through. So to kind of relate so the broader 
audience can relate to what, I, what we're talking about. So uh, talking about immigrant and ethnic communities in uh, Calcutta, uh, we see that they do, didn't originally land up uh, only in Calcutta. So uh, the point is not working. So if you see Calcutta, it's, it's downstream. It's the southernmost uh, point of that box, which is highlighted there. But upstream, if you see, there was little Europe on the Ganges. There was the presence of all the former European colonies along the River Hooghly, which naturally made this entire region uh, 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 gave it a very strong presence of other diverse communities. And when uh, Calcutta developed as the British settlement, all of them naturally migrated to Calcutta. So if you see the census uh, calculations of 1837, you had the Portuguese, you had the French, you had the Chinese, Armenians, um, all present in Calcutta. Some of them um, landed up there for trade, some of them migrated from the other European colonies which were already in uh, the area. So if you see this area map, this is largely 10 square um, kilometers. Uh, and again, uh, the pointer is not working, but where, the, where you have the circular uh, dotted, that, and that large artery, that is Mahatma Gandhi Road. So that kind of segregates, the, uh, no, everything north of Mahatma Gandhi Road is North Calcutta. The, the, the traditional Bengali neighborhoods as you start walking for north. And what you see right at the bottom uh, left, St. John's Church and Hare Street, that kind of marks the boundary of what, su what south of that is colonial Calcutta. So the Raj Bhavan and Dalhousie Square, Lal Digi, GPO. What is in this intermediary space, which as you can see is very amorphous. There are no clear boundaries. And the nomenclature of the streets kind of reinforce the ethnicities. So you have an old China Bazaar Street, you have an Armenian Street, uh, an Ezra Street, a Sunyat Sen Street, and the definitions are all blurred. So that's the gray town, and that's how the, the ethnic communities kind of lived and meshed with each other, how their cultural institutional, uh, institutions, religious institutions, uh, were not at conflict with each other. And I think that is very, very unique to Calcutta. So of course you had the Jews, uh, and their population currently stands at uh, under 30. But at the end of the 19th century uh, uh, and, and in the early 1940s, they were almost touching 4,000. And they were probably one of the most enterprising communities in Calcutta. And you, see, you still have two of their most important uh, synagogues, the, the, the Bethel Synagogue and the Magan David uh, Synagogue. And they have a very strong connection to David Sassoon, who of course has a huge uh, legacy in, in Bombay itself. And, uh, and, uh, and they, since they were so wealthy and they were financiers of land and buildings, so you can see these edifices. So they're not there, but they've left behind the Esplanade Mansion, the Chorungi Mansions, which were all financed and built by them. The Nahum Confectionery and a Jewish school, which today has Muslim students. They know, and they don't teach Hebrew anymore, but these markers in space continue to uh, operate and flourish, even though the community uh, has vanished. And then, of course, the, the, the Armenians, which today are at about 40 families, uh, 200 uh, people, who actually preceded the British in India. They actually came in 1697 to the Dutch uh, colony of Chinsura, which was um, upstream. And uh, the, the, the Holy Church of Nazareth in Calcutta actually dates to 1724, and it's one of the oldest religious structures in the city. The school, the, Arme uh, the Armenian college, the college has no Armenian native students, but has actually uh, Armenians coming from other parts of the world to study here. And it's very, very well endowed as a philanthropic institution. And they're, they're able to subsidize education. So it's very popular with Armenians in Armenia and not with the ones in Calcutta. And then, of course, the Greeks. And it's very, very peculiar. And their history is not really well uh, documented, other than the fact that they all came in the 1780s from London. Uh, from, via London from the Chios um, Island. And uh, incidentally, the, one of the biggest uh, industries they set up, which is today a subsidiary of the Tata Group, in fact, that is something I only found out two days back, was the Rally um, fan company, which I think today is Rally India, and that's what it's called. And you had uh, the, Acrop the Acropolo Cigarette and Tobacco Company, which also had a headquarter in Bombay, incidentally. And of course, there are three Greek Orthodox churches uh, in Calcutta. The third one stands today. So, and of course, those are the communities which don't have a presence anymore of the community, but just of their uh, institutions. 
But these are the two active communities still present in Calcutta, the Anglo-Indians and uh, the Chinese. And uh, though, of course, there are different uh, aspects that determine their future in the city, and I think that's something we're going to develop in the course, um, discuss in the course of this panel. Uh, but just to give you an overview of what this ethnicity and this ethnic diversity really means. Thank you. Thanks, Kamalika. Uh, Rafiq, in your documentary, The Legend of Fat Mama, in which uh, you're done for BBC in 2003, I wanted to know, I mean, it's on the Calcutta Jewish, it's on the Calcutta Chinese community, but it's a search for Fat Mama. So I want you to explain to the audience who is Fat Mama, what is the legend of Fat Mama, and why is there, why is Fat Mama so important for the history of the Chinese community? I want this. I have a connection with Calcutta thanks to uh, my girlfriend then who became my wife and she's sitting somewhere here. And that's what took me to Calcutta in the first place uh, repeatedly in early years when I first came to know her. And uh, I got interested, I, I, you know, I love food so I was invariably Sunday mornings in, uh, in the old Chinatown for breakfast and got talking to people. and. Uh, Childhood in Bombay, in Bombay Central, on Club Back Road, there was a Chinese school, uh, just two buildings away from my house. There was a Chinese newspaper in the same neighborhood. And in 1962, uh, in school, uh, when the India-China War took place, I found my Chinese classmates stopped coming to school. The school, a few buildings away, shut down. The newspaper shut down. And this was sort of somewhere at the back of my head. And uh, in Calcutta, uh, where I would meet the Chinese community and chat with them, I realized at some point that this was a landmark in their lives in the way partition was for, uh, for, for people in uh, North India or in, uh, in Pakistan, in Punjab. Uh, because the 62 war really scarred them because that was a war that India lost really badly. We, we were humiliated. And of course, we took out our anger on our fellow Indians who were you know, of Chinese origin and put them in prisoner of war camps in Rajasthan for periods ranging for three months to several years. Now, Fat Mama was a remarkable woman in old Chinatown. And really, for me, it's all uh, mm, through listening to people because by the time I w landed up, mm, she had passed away. But she was this enormous woman who on the street made uh, noodles uh, and, you know, she had big arms and the flesh kind of hung from the side. It was a noisy place and it was quite spectacular. And so I used her as a, as a kind of metaphor uh, and a, it's, it's the, the film is really about it. Uh, a, 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 in Indian Chinese who's now in Canada, who's come back to Calcutta searching for those noodles and for fat mama and through that tell the story of the Chinese community in Calcutta. And uh, also in that film, I tried to bring out this terrible moment in 1962 when we treated them uh, really uh, badly. And that, that, that film became the starting point of a very enduring relationship with the community. So, um, yeah, so that's all. Uh, really is great town, as uh, Kamalika said, and I really enjoyed that presentation very much. And I'm very attracted to great town. I'm part of great town. I live there. I stay in a small hotel just outside uh, Chinapada, and uh, there's, that's that's really is. Uh, uh, and I, while listening to Kamalika, I'm thinking of parallels uh, in Bombay, and I think Bombay too has that sort of you know. Uh, probably driven by commerce and industry that makes us so interdependent. So people of different ethnicities, of multiple identities can uh, have to live with each other, end up working with each other, coexisting and, and thriving most of the time, not all of the time. And in that sense, there's a tremendous parallel between Bombay and Calcutta. Um, I don't know if I have answered your question or you want to do a yes, follow-up. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question, actually, because I know a lot about the Bombay Chinatown. So I just wanted to know, 
What are the differences you perceive between the Chinatown in Bombay and that in Calcutta? Because we also have two Chinatowns, of course, which are largely non-existent. Most of the Chinese have left that precinct. So today, what are the differences that you see between the two Chinatowns? I think the Chinatown in Bombay is all but gone, you know. There's hmm. virtually no remnant left. Uh, Suklaji Street, which is near Bombay Central at the beginning of the red light district, hmm. that was one, that was really the Chinatown, you know. At New Year, you'd have the lanterns up and things like that. Hmm. There was even a small restaurant would eventually shut down. Hmm. There's a Chinese temple in Mazagon, which still exists. But all the people who came to Bombay were largely, I think they were largely employees, they were working at the dock, so they were okay. working as carpenters. A few were, you know, like hawkers, we would bring out silks on their bicycles. The and then of course dentists, you know, mm. who, of, uh, from the Hopai areas of China who mm. were in uh, dentists. Now they've all yeah. diminished, disappeared, never, uh, but in Calcutta they had businesses and not just Calcutta but uh, also parts of the, up in the hills, you know, in Darjeeling and Sikkim and um, uh, uh, even Nagaland, Dimapur, they all had businesses, small businesses, uh, leather, shoes, large businesses as in Tangra, which is a very thriving sort of pocket in Calcutta, uh, and um, big restaurants in Tangra. So they, they, had, they were, they had much larger stakes, they were bigger stakeholders in Calcutta. And so Calcutta had a community that was thriving much more than here, which kind of stayed on, it's, it's diminished substantially because of migration for economic reasons and of course because of the 1962 war. So it has diminished very substantially, but still, they, they're still far, far more visible and stronger there than they're anywhere else. Oh. Uh, when I was talking to Amit over the phone a few days ago, he mentioned that Calcutta is a little different from Bombay because Calcutta tends to absorb foreign influences and make it its own. He termed it cultural eclecticism. And uh, we talked about the uh, celebrations for Christmas and New Year. So can you explain how Calcutta is different from Bombay in that respect? Um, I, I, I don't know if it's different from Bombay, but I think the way cosmopolitanism, I, what I was re reacting to is the way cosmopolitanism gets talked about in India. So the, the way cosmopolitanism is talked about in India is as something that's an aggregate of various cultures. And, and the, <clears throat> and the uh, example held up uh, of, of you know, a cosmopolitan city is, um, is Bombay, therefore. Because in, in Bombay, you, uh, you, you conceive of Bombay very clearly as an aggregate of, of different communities and cultures. Um, and this is also also the way we think of secular or secularism. Um, we think of it in India as being something that is a that is a, a, a form of hospitality towards different cultures. Uh, sec secular, the secular experience has other meanings. To to for instance to 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 give value to uh, let's say a, a, a literary work or a building and say it's beautiful, uh, that, that, that is a secular valuation. It, it, ha it has nothing to do with this, this whole business of tolerance and aggregation that we've been talking right. about, or the okay. constitutional business. Right. It, 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 it talks about a different history of experience, which is secular. So, so you know, you're, you're not praising something because it comes uh, defined and sanctioned and made sacrosanct by religion. It's made sacrosanct by something else. What is it? We don't know. But we are saying, this is wonderful. That is a secular response. Similarly, Cosmopolitan has a completely different or related but distinct meaning, uh, which has to do with, um, I would say, uh, a, a, a kind of cultural eclecticism, which is inner, rather than necessarily outward. It can be outward. So I'm sure Bombay. I'm not sure, I know that Bombay has its own history of inward cultural eclecticism. And inward cultural eclecticism, what does that mean? It also means to be 
in no one fixed place. It means to be in exile from yourself. Basically, if you are in various places culturally, if you're traveling within yourself culturally, that it basically means you're estranged in subtle ways from your own identity. And I think uh, it's there in Bombay. So if you leave aside the outward kind of signs of the cosmopolitan kind of experience of different cultures, and if you look towards uh, another history, then you're going to find that in Bombay. But definitely you're going to find that in Calcutta. Uh, this, 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 this other history of cosmopolitanism as being a kind of a, a cultural traveling within oneself. Okay? Um, I'll, I'll give you one example of that, uh, uh, which, which should make it clearer, uh, but also why it's quite subtle and confusing. Um, the, the impact of westernization in, in, in Calcutta yeah. or in the Bengali. To, to look at it kind of in very simple terms, it should have led to the person wearing a suit and a tie and eating with cutlery and speaking perfect English. But that particular kind of Bengali was derisively called by Tagore and others, Ingo Bongo, you know, the English Bengali. And they never became the mainstream of cosmopolitan culture which appropriated the Western. Now the person who appropriated the Western was wearing a dhoti and a Punjabi. You know, unlike the Japanese counterpart who wore the suit with the impact of westernization, the Bengali cosmopolitan was wearing a dhoti and Punjabi. So whenever you saw Bengali, like 30 years ago, if you saw a Bengali uh, person in a dhoti and Punjabi coming down the street, mm. you would know he's a cosmopolitan. You know, oh, you, okay. you, that, that, was the, that, that, that was the first kind of resonance you would have. Uh, that has disappeared now. The okay. person in the dhoti Punjabi has disappeared and that very subtle but powerful history of cosmopolitanism is al almost g gone. But we, we have to make these, uh, these, these distinctions to understand in what way Calcutta uh, took on the West and then appropriated it and then created a, a very distinctive ethos, which can be very deceptive. Yeah. For instance, if you think that, oh, a Bengali, he eats, eats uh, luchi and chulad dal and he wears, uh, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Uh, dhuti, Punjabi, mm. uh, that is a true blue Bengali, but the true blue Bengali is a very recent invention and, and that, that person is also probably uh, interested in Rilke, oh. you know? So there's that strange mix going on. Uh, the person in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the suit does not have as rich and uh, inflected a history in Bengal. Uh, the, 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 the kind of impact of westernization is much more obvious, but somehow uh, has a less uh, deep uh, imprint and a less uh, rich history. Oh, okay. yeah. So okay. that's the cosmopolitanism I'm talking about. Oh. Uh, Kamalika, do you have anything to add on, it, or add on that from the architectural perspective? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so just taking off uh, from what um, Amit said, I think also cosmopolitanism can plays out in Calcutta um, in two interesting ways, where one is the spectator versus where one is the participant. So these two concepts and how the, hence we, we become one with the other. And, and I think uh, Christmas and New Year celebrations in Calcutta is a very, um, is a point in case where the Bengali or the rest of the city is a participant. Where, while in something like the Chinese New Year, uh, you're a spectator because it's not like you're not interacting with this community that you know about but you go to see a show you go to see the lion dance you go to see the li uh, dragon dance so in that sense uh, you you accept them you absorb them you understand what their culture is but you're still a spectator uh, whereas when we go to clubs and we have suckling pigs and we go to park street and we take part in the revelry and the whole idea of the baradin we are participants in, in that idea. So I think um, uh, how this plays out, um, I, I wouldn't really link that up to architecture uh, too much, but just insert the idea of intangible heritage as well, because architecture then brings us to tangible heritage, and what is what we see is the physical manifestation in, in, in our world. But the intangible aspects of festivity, food, culture, and how um, through, as cosmopolitan Calcuttans, we interact and interface with these different communities from their intangible heritage 
um, aspect at least becomes important to me. Uh, Kamalika, is this uh, something uh, similar to what you are doing with the CHA project in Calcutta? Yes. Incidentally, the CHA project is a project for heritage conservation, not just the built heritage, but also the intangible or reviving the community in their living spaces. So is that something that you would tie in with what you are doing in Calcutta? Sure. So I'll just give you a, like, a two minute introduction to what CHA even stands for. At one level, it's an acronym for Calcutta Heritage Alliance, but also this whole concept of CHA uh, being the Bengali word for tea, and it's so ingrained into the ethos of uh, the, the city. The, the CHA project looks at historic communities and now Actually, uh, the pilot project that I'm working on looks at the Chinese community, but not as um, a museum of, um, of where, where you museumize a community or look at them from as an exotic uh, group of people who've occupied your city. But you identify what and how the community has contributed uh, to your city so they, they are Calcuttans as well. They are Indian Chinese, but their passports are Indian. So they are not the other. They are one of us. So and they have a place and a settlement that they live in. So how do you look at the settlement and what their people do, what their livelihoods are, what their festivals are, um, and help them identify their strengths? Because that's one way of uh, saving the, the 2,000, 3,000 odd people who live in the city. How do you? curtail that migration they, because they've already either moved to uh, Toronto or other parts of the world. You, so the uh, intention of the CHA project is allow the Chinese and facilitate them to grow and, and not look at them as now we need to open a museum for uh, the Chinese that had come to Calcutta because they're very much there. Uh, Rafiq, uh, you have followed the trajectory of uh, the Chinese immigration out of India to Toronto and uh, in uh, The Legend of Fat Mama and also in your the next film that you have done on the Indian Chinese. I wanted to ask you is that do they look back to Calcutta fondly? Do they look back fondly to being Indian? Do they want to come back or is it just to visit family? What is the, are they very hurt with their internment of 1962? Is that generation passing on? Um, I think the ties with India are eternal. Um, I meet Chi Indian Chinese in Toronto, for example, and they tend to marry other Indian Chinese. And when they do marry, uh, they have Indian songs and they have tandoori chicken, you know. So that attachment, that connect with their childhood remains. It's there in my film. Um, it's very uh, much there. But I think. Uh, 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 a, a, a larger project or a, or a parallel project that we need to undertake uh, uh, as, as citizens is to really uh, m make sure that we all know of this particular incident of 1962. I think uh, we, we need to know about it. We need to accept that we did something drastically wrong. Uh, there is no, uh, there are no records uh, uh, I tried to get records by, through RTI, etc., etc. There are just no records. These people were randomly picked up, usually in the middle of the night, and taken away. And those who were not taken away, they lived in fear, anticipating the midnight knock every day. And uh, many other Indian Chinese were picked up and put in local jails in Assam, in um, Jamshedpur, in also in Bombay and Bangalore and all over, there's no, there's no numbers. And that's a very serious hurt and because they are such a minuscule number who don't constitute a vote bank or have no influence whatsoever, are completely ignored. And I think we owe them a citizen's apology or we owe them a formal apology like the uh, Japanese Americans got from their own government. And that's really the, a part of my ongoing interest in the Chinese community. Uh, I do, uh, I'm really happy about this CHA project and I really often despaired because A, I think they, they, f they became so temporary, the Chinese community, this feeling of temporariness because even nationality, many of them are, s are in, in limbo land, you know, because uh, especially those who 
were born or came to India just before the British left. So the British disowned them and India disowned them too. And every year they have to renew their permits to stay. And some of them are old people who have to travel from distant parts of India to Calcutta to a registration office and, you know, renew their uh, residency every year. So uh, I think we need to sort that out. In that process, a lot of things are lost. Like just one example is there was this old printing press with, uh, which had these uh, Chinese characters and it's there in my film. And somewhere along the way, it closed down, of course, and then they sold the building, they sold the press, they sold the type by weight, you know, and it mm. became molten uh, iron, you know. And the, the whole thought that here was these type faces that were writing the history of the Chinese in India, that were printing newspapers and books, etc., just became molten uh, iron or whatever and ended up with a kabar, uh, with a, uh, 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 as junk really broke me, you know, mm -hmm. and it was too late by the time I got to know about it. But that's the kind of stuff that we needed to preserve. We need to preserve identity cards from prison, you know. Many of them held on to their identity cards and we need to hold. They didn't talk to their children, you know. There were silences within families, within generations. And we need to get people to talk. We need to archive that. So I hope that happens on, on, at a parallel level as well. And that's where we will rebuild, you know, bonds with um, each other and give them a stake, you know, an emotional stake in the country. Rafiq, just a little out of interest, is that also the case with the Indian Chinese in Bombay? Because you talk about them just having to renew their uh, stay permits. Uh, they don't have passports uh, or... No, it, it's uh, yeah. true for some Indian Chinese in Bombay. I, mm -hmm. I don't know too much about the Chinese in Bombay because... Right. Uh, you know, I did spend much more time in Calcutta, and mm -hmm. so, uh, but it's true, Bombay too has this problem, and they too need to renew their permits. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the numbers, I don't know the percentages. Mm -hmm. But in Calcutta, there's a very significant percentage. Okay. Uh, Kamalika, is there any kind of movement under this project to say, revive the precinct for the Baghdadi Jews, the Armenians, the Anglo-Indians? Um, well, other than the Chinese and the Anglo-Indian, the, the, the critical mass of having a sizable population that can actually, uh, that you can bring this change about, because there's only that much that a government or an external agent can do. A, a lot of this change comes through when the community is active, they want this change, and they're willing to be a partner in this mobilization process. What has happened with, unfortunately, with the, with the Jews and... Uh, uh, as in, or the Armenians is is that they've dwindled to such a number that their 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 buildings, their institutions is what is left right. uh, than really the people. So it's just the built heritage that you can conserve, and there's nothing you can do about revitalizing the community, the intangibles, as you call it. The the intangibles again, uh, it would become as a spectator. Like right. I can take part in a festival. But to go to a Jewish family's house and have sit with them over a table and have share a meal right. is different from so there, there are all these restaurants which have actually now come up come up in Calcutta which actually serve uh, authentic Burmese food or um, authentic uh, Chinese food. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same as going and eating home style Chinese food cooked in some of these residents' homes in Chinatown. Right. Because there's a very str uh, strong distinction between which food is Cantonese, which food is Hakka. It's not a generic ethnic food that oh. you're having at a restaurant. Amit, coming to you is, as a writer, how important is it that Calcutta secures, revives, and nurtures its multi-ethnic menu, as it were? How important is it to draw inspiration? It's, it's, it's history, which, mm. which is, if not a under attack, it's it's um, misrepresented or, but n in a very different way. It's it, it's not done. Uh, it, history is not misrepresented or forgotten or regurgitated or, or rewritten um, in order to uh, necessarily um, advance uh, major majoritarian religious uh, 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 agendas. 
you know, that's not something that's really happened in Calcutta. Right. I mean, the BJP has never been able to make inroads mm -hmm. into Calcutta. Uh, now, we, after having almost five years of a government headed by somebody who has alienated a lot of people in Calcutta, uh, the BJP uh, came into the conversation all of a sudden. Right. Uh, but uh, the BJP itself has behaved so alarmingly in the months, it's, uh, in the year and a half or two years it's been in power that they're, they're out, they seem to be out of the conversation again in Calcutta, you know? Um, I, so I don't, I mean, it is, it is remarkable, the, 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 the attitude towards um, multi, the multicultural, the multi-ethnic, uh, the, the um, even caste, that's, that's, that has been historically characteristic of Calcutta. Uh, that itself is not so much under attack. What, is un, what, what we don't have is enough of an engagement with that history. I think. Okay. We don't have an, an, enough of an, a serious engagement. The, 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 there is no serious engagement on the part of the Bengali with Bengali history, whichever form that history takes, whether it's tangible, intangible, archival. Uh, right. it, I, I don't think that a serious engagement is the dominant tone of the engagement of, with history in Calcutta. What you have, for instance, the last 10 years, almost every other songwriter or poet has, has gone into oblivion in comparison with Tagore. Right. Uh, I think 20 years ago you would hear of others. Uh, the, the kind of, the, the rise of Tagore in a particular way uh, and, and also the kind of, the, the broadcasting of Tagore songs which happened in the last five years through loudspeakers at traffic jams. Mm -hmm. The genuflection towards Tagore is a genuflection towards a particular idea of Bengali culture. Right. Uh, all of which, uh, refuses to, to, uh, to actually uh, engage with uh, the past, the Bengali past, and the Bengali past's very playful, irreverent, and interesting engagement with what you, ca what you call multi-ethnicity, -eth oh. uh, which you see in Tagore himself, that Tagore's own engagement with the past mm. and his engagement with different cultures is, uh, is very unpredictable and irreverent and very surprising, okay. uh, leading to great innovation. But that, that great innovation was only possible because of the unpredictable nature of the engagement. So, so now we've moved a million miles away from that mindset which made that unpredictability possible. Right. Would you like to read something from your book on Calcutta, something yeah, that fits you, in with what we are talking about? You asked me to read something short, which yeah. I can see. Uh, and it's something about Christmas, and I can yes, see why. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, 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 and I think this is quite short. Um, it's it's just like a page and a half, or, you know. Uh, and and uh, the, the thing about Christmas, which I, I think Calcutta has the most amazing Christmases. I've never experienced uh, such wonderful Christmases anyway. It went completely on the back burner in the 70s after the Naxalites and all the, mm -hmm. the problems to do with the city. And it's made it... Uh, it's made its presence felt again, but like other major festivals like Durga Puja, as a kind of work, or partly energized by the, the working class. Okay. Earlier it was a middle class mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, 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 festivity. But um, by the way, these words are very interesting, middle class. Uh, the Bengalis have an, uh, two words for middle class. One is Modhobitto and the other is Bhadrolok. One is a, one is a kind of valuation and another is an economic classification. Okay. Uh, and and uh, one would be interested to see what, which other Indian languages have, what the words for middle class are. Right. For instance, in English, middle class in India is often used pejoratively, you know, right. as being, uh, you know, he's just middle class, he can't uh, afford, uh, right. you know, uh, etc. So, uh, but, but, uh, but middle class means something completely different in Calcutta and, and its history. And Christmas was a middle class, like Durga Puja, a middle class festival and a very urban festival. You cannot think of the Calcutta Christmas or the Calcutta Pujas happening anywhere outside of Calcutta. Its, uh, its effect is located in being an urban festival to do with the neighborhoods and the and, and this particular locations. So I'm going to read something about Christmas after it has, it has really become now more of a 
not just a middle class festival in Calcutta, but has made its way back. Um, a friend visiting from London tells me how he likes the Calcutta Christmas much more than he likes the English one. I do too, but he has specific reasons. And he has no memory of a Calcutta Christmas to refer back to. Calcutta, in effect, has no past for him. He's only been here once before. There's not much sign of the crucifix here, he says. You don't even have that awful mournfulness of Christianity. It's all about Santa, he concludes, nodding. He has seen gigantic simulacra of the bearded gift bearer in shopping malls, in front of restaurants. Although globalization in its full blown form is yet to reach Bengal, its apparitions this December are clearly visible. Thus the striking Kumbhakarna-like dimensions of many of the Santa Clauses. And there aren't that many nativity scenes, he says. In fact, I haven't seen any. He's right. It's an absence I hadn't noticed, perhaps with good reason. In Oporna Shen's lovely first film, 36 Chorungi Lane, the director almost forces an analogy when she plays a recording of a tenor singing stratospherically Silent Night over visuals of destitutes sleeping on bridges and pavements. To find a representation of the nativity, one might need to go to a church. But on the whole, the miraculous birth is unremarked upon. The predominant atmosphere of Christmas here has never been one of solitary stock taking or of the notion of the return of God to earth, but of make believe. I think I won't read any more because of uh, short of time. So. Oh. Just one last general question. Supposing I were to come to Calcutta, say catch the flight and come in tomorrow, where would I get the best Chinese momos? Where would I get a Sabbath meal? Where would I be able to eat Armenian food? And where would I be able to get Greek food? If I just wanted to explore Calcutta through its cuisine, just the different facets of foreign communities. I don't know. Anyone can take the question. Each one could sort of, you know. I can tell you about the momos. Okay. <laughs> I think the best momos are on Benting Street. There's a shoe shop called John Hing. And the owner's wife, she runs a little takeaway at the back. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, if you phone her in advance, She'll make you a hundred momos, deep freeze them down to minus 20 until they're like rock hard and you can <laughs> fly back with them, which I do. And uh, they're outstanding. And of course, uh, you know, pressures of pr costs and all that, so the, 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 the meat part is dwindled a bit. So then I tell them, charge me more and make sure there's lots of meat in it. And I think those are the best momos. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, about the Armenian, Greek, Jewish, I know about Nahums, but I can't think of, uh, no, my expertise ends here. And I think uh, for Chinese, definitely, I mean, when I started working uh, with the Chinese community about two years back, that's when I realized how ignorant I am, and I used to think there's this one kind of Chinese food uh, which is available in Calcutta, and this Indian Chinese that we go and eat in all these restaurants, many of uh, which are owned by uh, the, the community itself. But then when I stepped into their homes, I realized that that food is so different from what you eat in a restaurant owned by them. Because they cater to a different palate or a different sort of sensibility. So home style Cantonese food is something I realized that very few or no Calcutta restaurants actually sell. And, 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 that's, uh, and I wouldn't be able to point out to any Jewish or Armenian or Greek uh, because because the critical mass is not there, the mm. community is not there to really preserve their food culture, to take it forward, or even give it a twist. So I will end up in something that says Greek restaurant and go and eat your sadziki, but that's definitely not what the community will probably eat. Amit, what about Anglo-Indian or food? You know, Christmas I've asked pudding. myself these questions yeah. many times. Yeah. Where do I get great Chinese momos? You don't get them anywhere because momos are Tibetan and you, okay. there, there are no Chinese momos as such. But, but you know, uh, but, but I don't like momos. I mean, I'm very interested in Rafiq's outstanding momos because for me that's a contradiction <laughs> in terms. But, you know, I, I, would, I would like to, I'd like to taste them. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm the wrong person to, to <laughs> comment on this. Yeah, well, actually, I called up Calcutta and spoke to a contact of mine who's Jewish. And she says that for Jewish tourists, I don't know if they manage it for non-Jewish people also, they actually have Sabbath meals. They're one of the residents who hosts a Sabbath dinner every Friday night for visiting Jew Jewish tourists. And they do conduct service at the Bethel as well as the Magin David and the Nava Shalom synagogue. There are three functioning synagogues and three cemeteries and just 30 Baghdadi Jews present in Calcutta, of course, all old, but they have a constant inflow of tourists coming in, Jewish tourists. So I can tell you that you can get a Jewish meal yet. And Armenian is also possible because a few years ago, I met the Armenian pastor in Bombay and they do run the school and they do have Armenian students coming in. So I'm sure even an Armenian meal is possible in Calcutta today. So I think all of you should go back and explore that. Can you email me the details? I is. will, I will, I will. Okay, we are going to end with showing a short clip from Rafiq's uh, documentary, The Legend of Fat Mama, and then we'll open up for Q&A. And the trams moving like shadows coming home that day. And me, I am following my notes all the way from camp, seeking garlic, red peppers, soya, and sesame oil. And some larger than life. Outside, there's a hint Prawn wafers getting their suntans in time for the Chinese New Year ahead. And a gaggle of children preparing for the big day. That little girl is Huamula, named after a legendary female warrior. Huamula is also the name of the group. One is of Hakka origin, an ex-vice principal. The other, a Cantonese furniture maker, together in Calcutta's melting walk. China Town is not like before. Before we have so many children on the road, so much life. They chase each other, they fight, they make noise. When you see the ice cream wala coming, then you see how they run after him and then take out the money trying to grab the first one before the other gets. And it's such a joy to see all this. But now we are there. At the Mahjong clubs of Calcutta's Chinatown, the legendary female warrior would be just as pleased with the spirit of combat. It keeps the elderly so alert, so focused, so competitive. But one conflict that nobody was prepared for changed everything one morning in 1962. The Indochina War. As the two giant neighbors and one-time friends battled it out in the mountains, an unspoken human tragedy unfolded in Calcutta and other Indian cities where the Chinese lived. Thanks to the defense of India rules and two words that can so easily be misused, national interest, Chinese schools, Chinese newspapers, and many Chinese business establishments were forced to shut down. The most powerful link remains Hindi cinema.
तुम हमें पहचान लो ए तुमसे अच्छा कौन है Everything begins and ends at the old Chinese temple in Achipur, where the first Chinese came to Calcutta over 200 years ago. Fat Mama is no more. She is probably in a Chinatown somewhere above, still making those heavenly noodles. And the Chinese, like trams in Calcutta. Are going, 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 but not gone. Thank you so much.